The following program is an original production of WICC PBS Chicago. Tonight on In the Loop, tougher sentencing. A new effort to crack down on repeat gun offenders stalls in Springfield as Chicago's murder rate skyrockets. If those individuals, after being convicted, after serving their time, go out and illegally obtain another gun and hit the streets with them, that individual should be treated differently. Burying the young, how some Chicago area funeral homes cope with violence themselves, even as they bury young victims of the city's brutal crime wave. It can be very frustrating because uh, sometimes it's not the first time that death may have happened to a family. It could be uh, unfortunately, um, two or three times in the same family. Stay with us for this week's edition of In the Loop. Good evening, I'm Chris Bury. Thanks for joining this week's edition of In The Loop. Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson has something in common with his predecessor, Gary McCarthy. They have both been passionate about demanding tougher sentences for criminals who commit multiple felonies with guns. Now, after a sickening spike in violence that included more than 4,000 shootings and 760 homicides last year, legislation to get tough on gun felons is pending at the state capitol. But whether a crackdown on repeat offenders is the right way to fight crime remains a matter of fierce debate. On a Tuesday afternoon in February, a 26-year-old reputed gang member Lazaric Collins was in a car driven by his pregnant girlfriend. They were driving in the Lawndale neighborhood on the city's west side. Collins' two-year-old nephew, Levante White Jr., was in the back seat. They pulled down this alley. On her phone, Collins' girlfriend live streamed what happened next. More than a dozen shots were fired before the shooters sped off. Collins was hit five times. His girlfriend was shot in the stomach and fled the scene, phone in hand. But Collins' toddler nephew, Levante, was struck in the head by a stray bullet, still strapped in his car seat. Both Collins and Levante were pronounced dead at Stroger Hospital. And my gut is telling me when we finally find this guy, we're going to find that he's a repeat gun offender. Superintendent Eddie Johnson's pronouncement would prove prophetic. Two days later, 26-year-old gang member Devon Swan was charged with Levante's murder. He's a convicted felon who's been arrested nine times, including previous gun arrest for unlawful use of a weapon, armed robbery, escape from custody, and numerous narcotics arrests. The suspect in that double murder has a lot in common with others responsible for the mayhem on Chicago's streets. He is a repeat gun offender. As the numbers of shootings and murders propelled Chicago's violence into the national spotlight and even the president's Twitter feed, new research showed a strong connection between repeat gun offenders and violent attacks. An annual report from the University of Chicago Crime Lab showed a staggering 35% of those arrested for a shooting or homicide last year had prior gun-related arrests. Frank Maine is a crime reporter at the Chicago Sun-Times. A phrase that one hears sometimes on the street is it's better to be judged by 12 than carried by six, meaning um, it's better to go to court and get a lenient sentence than to die and get buried because you didn't have a gun and weren't able to protect yourself. Maine reports from the front lines of the city's gang wars. He sees firsthand the revolving doors of repeat gun offenders. You'll see many times um, somebody will get about a year in prison for gun possession in Chicago. And many times they'll do a turnaround, meaning they're in jail and they're waiting to go to prison for their sentence, but they've already done the time in the jail and they get turned out on the street without even going into the Illinois Department of Corrections. And, um, I think that gang members have known that for a long time. There's a sense out there that um, I can do this and there's no consequence to it. 
Illinois State Senator Kwame Raoul is trying to change that mindset. He's co-sponsored legislation that would mandate stiffer sentencing for repeat gun offenders. We say the current range of 3 to 14 for that repeat gun offender, we say uh, it's 7 to 14. But opponents of the legislation, including Cook County Public Defender Amy Campanelli, says it fails to address the root causes of Chicago's violence. I think this is a political move, a quick fix to make someone feel good. I've done this law, so I've done my part. We know that's not going to do anything. We have very strict laws on if you possess a weapon and you've possessed a weapon in the past, you can get up to 14 years. Has violence subsided? Have we seen a less violent Chicago? The current law provides sentences from 3 to 14 years if offenders have previous felony convictions. The proposed legislation requires judges to explain in writing if sentences are below the presumptive minimum, about seven years. The presumptive seven years means the judges will probably always give seven. I am concerned that the judges will treat it like a mandatory minimum. And we've already seen what mandatory minimums have done. They have not made us safer. Senator Raul disagrees, noting that judges considering cases on their merits will be key to getting violent repeat offenders off the streets. We want to have leeway for a judge to look at the circumstances of the offense, uh, the background of the individual, and, and to say, okay, we have unique circumstances here that uh, don't dictate that we sentence this person as high. Instead of focusing on repeat gun offenders, Campanelli favors an emphasis on the problems that lead to gun violence. These communities are poor and they're segregated, and that's why we have violence, because of poverty and segregation. So we have to make their world different. We have to increase their knowledge about feeling safe, and I don't have to pick up a gun to feel safe. I don't have to join a gang and sell dope. I've got another job lined up for me. I can go to college hopelessness then brings these youthful kids to join gangs and pick up guns. So let's stop the hopelessness. But from his interviews with gang members, reporter Frank Main says stiffer sentencing might be effective for repeat offenders. If the punishment is swift and certain, gang members will pay attention to it. Gang members in Chicago don't really have a problem spending small amounts of time in the Cook County Jail. They know people there, they, you know, they've been there before. They have a bigger problem going downstate for a long period of time. It takes them out of circulation and, you know, nobody wants to be locked up in prison for a long time. A new bill that includes those tougher sentences for repeat offenders passed a key committee in Springfield on a razor-thin one-vote margin, but it still faces significant opposition from Republicans and Democrats alike. Joining us now to talk about this are 15th Ward Alderman Raymond Lopez, Stephanie Coleman, Policy Director of the Children and Family Justice Center at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law, and Shabani Matani, reporter for The Wall Street Journal, and welcome to all of you. Thank you. Alderman Lopez, let me start with you. Is Superintendent Johnson right? Do we need tougher, mandatory sentences for repeat gun felons? I think the superintendent is 100% correct in his assertion. When I was growing up, the old adage was, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. But right now, criminals, in particular, repeating criminals, know that they can get arrested and they'll be out relatively quickly uh, for the same offense. And in many cases, in many of the communities I represent, West Englewood, Gage Park, Back of the Yards, a number of our gun perpetrators are repeat offenders. It's not something that I've read about. It's something that I've seen and experienced firsthand. And I think that if we're able to send a stronger message that you will be locked up longer if you continue on these bad behaviors, it will start to resonate with those individuals. Stephanie, right approach here? No. Um, what we do have in Illinois are very strong and increasing sentences for repeat gun possession, all of which are mandatory minimum prison terms. Uh, they do increase on a second time offense, which is the offense that is targeted here, second time gun possession without a license. Uh, when those laws were discussed in the, by the city of Chicago over the last few years, they've been uncharacterized They've been mischaracterized as unduly lenient. Uh, that's not true across the country, and it's certainly 
you know, not true compared against the federal system. Shabani, what are the, the political dynamics of this? It's gone to Springfield. We've heard hearings. It did pass a committee. But there's still some major opposition here. Right. As you, as you note, you know, you're not seeing the traditional sort of partisan Democrat versus Republicans, um, you know, split on this, right? I think you are seeing some of the same opposition, you know, from some Democrats that you saw a couple of years ago when then Superintendent McCarthy tried the same thing and tried to impose mandatory minimums that looked more like what New York City has in place, you know, with their gun laws, uh, where, you know, people obviously bristle at any idea of sort of the word mandatory minimums. It sort of harks back to this era of mass incarceration. Um, and, you know, on the other hand, you, you do see Republicans who, who don't face the same problem of crimes in their community. You know, because they, it's a rural area. Yeah, and they, they don't have the same, you know, issues with violence there, um, for whom, you know, the gun issue is very, very sensitive, right? And for whom, you know, they, they're worried that their constituents might see this as penalties for gun owners more broadly, even though, you know, the superintendent has really tried to stick to the message that this is repeat gun offenders. It's a very targeted Let's thing. Let's talk about this mandatory minimum issue, because that was applied to certain drug crimes, and it, it led to, as you suggest, mass incarceration. Aren't these gun crimes different, Alderman? I believe they are, because they have a, a very different impact on our communities. Right now, we are seeing innocent people being gunned down by people who have repeatedly shown a wanton disregard for the law and willingness to use guns to solve all of their problems, whether it's a Facebook Live post or gang issue or other. And it's impacting people on a daily basis. Not two miles from here, a six-year-old girl was shot by someone with a repeat gun offense in, in their record because they were upset about something that somebody said on a block. The, if that gentleman had been incarcerated under this law, that six-year-old would never have been shot. And we need to get that message out to start correcting this behavior because right now, it's, people think that if I carry a gun, I, it proves that I'm tough. It proves my street cred. And it gives me some level of confidence to walk down the street. And that is completely the wrong message to try and legitimize by saying that sentencing you for being caught again is, not gonna, is a problem. Let's look uh, for a minute. We talked about New York. Um, New York City has about three times the population of Chicago, yet it has less than half of the homicides last year. And that New York state gun law, minimum three and one half years for gun felonies. In Illinois, repeat offenders on average are out in less than two years. So Stephanie, it doesn't seem like the judges are imposing those tougher penalties if uh, the average offender is out in less than two years. Well, I'm not sure that that is true. Um, the latest data that I've seen shows that judges certainly are sentencing within the mandatory sentencing ranges. And it's important to know that uh, in the New York uh, experience was that their homicide decline happened well before they put those mandatory minimums in place. And if you look at other places, for instance, Los Angeles, where the homicide rate is one quarter that of Chicago, they have a misdemeanor offense for gun possession, and they also have uh, lower sentences in general for repeat uh, gun possession. And what they've done instead is focused on a public health, public safety approach uh, that has done more for them than we've experienced here. Shabani, um, in the New York case, is there more to it than just tougher sentences? Yeah, so I think I think in New York, um, you know, as Stephanie notes, there was definitely that big drop that you saw, you know, in the early 2000s, and then um, mandatory minimums came in, um, and and then that sort of you know sort of solidified the conditions there for which you know you you just see crime getting lower and lower, right? Um, but you know, I think I think it's really important to note as well that you know with this specific bill that's being pushed in Springfield, I think they've been very careful to avoid the the, the word mandatory at all, right? And they've said that they're just encouraging judges to make public, you know, that their decisions, if they do choose to go below that, that recommended sentencing range, just to try to kind of minimize um, that opposition and find a political way forward. But Alderman, um, would it send a message to these gangbangers um, that if, if the legislature did pass a law that clearly toughened the sentences for repeat felons, wouldn't that get out into the street? I think it absolutely would. The first time it gets applied, people will see that there are tougher consequences for their actions. And I, I want to be clear that it's, it's a miscarriage, a, a misrepresentation to say that this is like a backdoor for mandatory sentencing. Because this holds 
repeat offenders accountable if they choose to continue on this path of how they engage with the community, but it also holds our judicial system accountable, which right now is laughed at by criminals. For a judge to have to explain now why he set a, a minimum sentence for someone who has multiple gun offenses, he is now accountable to the community that elects him because our judges are elected. So it helps not only send the message to the gang members, but it also sends a message to the circuit court judges who have to answer to their constituents. What do you think the practical effect of that is going to be if judges have to explain in writing? It absolutely is intended to and will result in increased political pressure, as the alderman notes, to have judges sentenced within the higher end of the range. This is layering a presumptive maximum sentence on top of the current mandatory minimum. And it's uh, unprecedented in our criminal code. It will put a great deal of pressure on judges to explain themselves. That's the intent of it. But won't it protect people? I mean, why are we worried about repeat offenders instead of the people who are getting shot? If you carry a gun in the state of Illinois three times without a license, loaded in public, your sentence is under a three strikes law, six to 30 years. That's a lot of time for three nonviolent offenses. Now, are they good offenses? No. Are they risky? Yes. But it's important that we address that behavior in any number of other ways than prison time, where low-level nonviolent offenders are being put into conditions that are overcrowded with higher-level, high-risk people. But to be fair, this law allows some latitude for the judge to give a lower sentence to an individual who may have just been carrying a weapon out of fear as opposed to someone who is shooting or committing violent crimes. This is intended to stop violent repeat offenders because I believe actually the testimony that was given when we were in Springfield was that if you have an older gentleman who maybe works the late shift and has a gun on him for his own personal protection and is arrested, a judge would be able to take and entertain those extenuating circumstances and describe why he gave him a lighter sentence as opposed to someone who is walking around at 2 a.m with a stroller, with a, a rifle and a handgun and a box of ammo with the intent to shoot and kill someone. The other part of this uh, issue, of course, in Chicago is policing. Uh, New York and Los Angeles have both done some precision policing. It's also taken place in Chicago. But since the Laquan McDonald tape uh, was released, Shabani, we have seen a dramatic fall off in the percentage of police stops. It's dropped like something like 80%, right. correct me if, if, if I'm wrong. Has that also contributed to this incredible spike in shootings and homicides. Yeah, so I think I think people, you know, who are arguing against this legislation, you know, would, would definitely say um, the laws have been the same for a number of years, but we saw this massive spike of crime between 2015 and 2016. So what happened between 2015 and 2016? I guess you had two things, right? So you had the, the video uh, that was released of the Laquan McDonald shooting, and you also had the ACLU agreement with the Chicago Police Department that required them to, you know, fill out um, uh, More paperwork, big report. basically, exactly. instead of the contact cards. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that, you know, both of that had, had a massive impact on on policing, right? Um, you know, whether you want to use the term focus and effect, I, I know it's very loaded, it's very political, um, but there's a definite feeling on the street that there's been a pullback on two fronts, both from the community calling the police less, sort of taking the issue of justice and, and you know, retribution in, into their own hands, as well as, you know, a, a pullback from the police who feel less incentivized to do, you know, stops, um, who feel less incentivized to, to sort of go out there and, and kind of do their jobs. Um, but Alderman, I, are, you, are you seeing that? Are you seeing that the Chicago Police Department is not as willing to confront the bad guys? I wouldn't say that they're not willing, they're not able. And there is a, a huge difference because of the ACLU, because of the new state laws that are out there. In the past, an officer who knew someone was a known drug dealer, for example, can pull that, in, that individual over and, and engage that person to find out if he was, in fact, selling drugs on that corner again. Now that is not possible. The officer now can only approach that individual if he sees him in the commission of a crime. And unfortunately, our police officers are not always able to see people as they're committing crime in live time. That does not mean that they're pulling back, that just means the rules of engagement have changed. And as Shivani was saying, the community has noticed, the police has noticed, but the gang members have noticed. And getting back to the sentencing, the gangs are well aware of how they can play the laws to their advantage. And just like with the ACLU agreement, if we do not enact tougher legislation for repeat gun, offender, gun offenders, they will use that to their advantage as well. Stephanie, the um, head of the Chicago Police Union, 
uh, was in Washington, D.C., actually meeting with President Trump um, recently. And he came away from that meeting saying that the, the president wants to let police officers be police officers. Do you see the political pendulum swinging a little bit uh, when it comes down here to the Chicago policing level? I think that any message coming from Washington that seems to give cover to unconstitutional policing, which, to be clear, was what was happening and what these changes have been aimed to prevent, is extremely distressing. Uh, the fact that the new attorney general referred to the Department of Justice investigation of the CPD as anecdotal, but also claimed that he hadn't read it, is also distressing. Uh, what we have in Chicago is a policing crisis, yes, but it is not one that's caused by additional paperwork to explain that what you're doing is constitutional practice. It is a drop in faith uh, from already low levels of communities that the police are available and prepared to protect them. It's what's driving a lot of gun carrying behavior and it's certainly not helping to address that behavior. There are many neighborhoods around the city of Chicago where uh, calling 911, according to an ACLU suit that's been going on for the past five or six years, it takes twice as long when life and limb are threatened to get a response by the Chicago police than in a white wealthy district. And that sort of response is something that is extremely important to public safety. And throw into this now is the Justice Department threatening to withhold federal money from the Chicago Police Department. Is there some irony in that? Well, yeah, I think it will have a huge, you know, kind of impact um, just sort of on the community level if, if federal grants are, are kind of removed from Chicago. Uh, in New York, it was really, really notable that they had the, the money both from the federal level and the number of police officers that was able to bring down that crime even before the sentencing laws, you know, even before those changes came in. So. No place in Chicago, unfortunately, is immune from gun violence, including the places where mourners gather to pay their last respects. Over the last year, funeral homes in the Chicago area reported at least 17 acts of violence during wakes and funerals. The violence that plagues Chicago spills over to the unlikeliest places. We think of funerals as a time for reflection and funeral homes as sanctuaries. But in some neighborhoods, those who are mourning the dead are too often becoming the victims of violence themselves. In November 2012, Charles Childs, co-president of A.A. Rayner and Sons Funeral Home, was overseeing a funeral at the church across the street when shots rang out. It was retaliation. And unfortunately, uh, the police were in the community. They were in the neighborhood, but they weren't right in the church. So they couldn't prevent it. When the dust cleared, 21-year-old Sherman Miller was dead, and 27-year-old Deontay Owsley was seriously wounded. Police say both men were members of the gangster disciples. It can be very frustrating because uh, sometimes it's not the first time that death may have happened to a family. It could be, uh, unfortunately, um, two or three times in the same family that uh, this behavior is, is, um, it has caught up with them. A.A. Rayner and Sons opened its doors in 1947. Since then, the family-owned business in the Southside Park Manor neighborhood has seen Chicago go through major transformations. The funerals tell a bigger story. Lately, Childs finds himself performing an increasing number of funerals for those dying in the gang wars plaguing the city. Tensions at these services can run high and hot. Sometimes there's a lot of grief. Sometimes there's a lot of not only the remorse of it, but also the, the, the vengeance to find out who did it so I can do something. Due to the heightened potential for violence, Child says they've had to take precautions most funeral homes don't have to consider. When we find out what happened to the deceased and we can see that it was a homicide or, or a murder victim, we know that there's going to be a lot of young people there. We're going to have to notify the Chicago Police Department because we're going to need some control with the traffic. Because if you have three, four hundred people out front, you know, you want to know what's going on. And after arranging nearly 50 funerals in 2016 for young victims, Childs knows how quickly things can turn ugly. We have seen violence in the, in the beginning and at the end. Certainly the friends um, are, are reacting a little differently than somebody that might be elderly who's had more life lessons and more life experience. 
Adding to the grief from an untimely death can be the financial burden. Funerals can cost anywhere from five to $7,000. Most of their clients are young and their deaths are sudden, often leaving families without the benefit of life insurance to cover funeral costs. In those cases, Child says he always tries to work with the families. There are fees that are adjustable and then there are fees that we just simply can't adjust. So we try to deal with families and, and, and work with families so that um, they're spending what they can afford to spend and not overspending. Childs admits performing so many funerals for young victims of violence can be frustrating, but it's not his job to pass judgment. No, we don't judge. We're here to try to uh, comfort the other members of the family who may have nothing to do with that lifestyle, but we understand and, and we have to be compassionate about it. A group of Chicago funeral directors is asking for legislation that requires tougher penalties for gun crimes during funerals. We have a couple minutes left and I want to come back to the panel here and see if there is a hopeful note from each of your very different perspectives that we can conclude on. Uh, Alderman, where are you seeing any, any bright spots in this horrible story? I think where our bright spots are in this story and just in violence in general, is that we're seeing a willingness for the community, if they believe that their leaders are willing to tackle the issues with them, to step up. Um, oftentimes we've seen where the community hides behind the curtains, retreats to their homes and locks their doors. But I think that as we have and continue these discussions in, in a frank and honest way, and sometimes looking at the ugly truths, whether or not we want to admit to it or not, um, the residents in the community are responding. And once they start responding, things change. And we have seen those changes in my neighborhoods. And I think if we can carry that message to every corner of the city, we'll be in a better spot. Stephanie, any room for hope from your perspective? Yes, I echo everything that the alderman said. Uh, also, uh, we put out a report um, in conjunction with about 50 organizations called Building a Safe Chicago that recommends uh, five elements of a public safety plan that we think is required. And advocacy by community and civic organizations around the elements of that plan is continuing, as well as the block-by-block -block level organization. So I think there is plenty of hope. Shabani, we've got about 30 seconds left. Want to weigh in on this? Sure. Um, you know, I, I do think that there's a sense with the Justice Department report, um, you know, with the with the reforms that the Chicago Police Department is undertaking now, that there is a real sense of things things are changing here. You know, things are moving in a different direction, and there is some will behind that, even if it's not coming from Washington, even if the federal level you know, um, it remains to be seen what, what's going to happen there. I still think that there's will definitely to, to change what's happening here in Chicago. And the city of Chicago is hiring another thousand police officers over the next two years. So we'll see if that also helps bring down these, uh, these very terrifying uh, crime numbers that we see. I want to thank our guests, Alderman Raymond Lopez, Stephanie Coleman, and Shabani Matani. Well, that concludes tonight's program. To learn more about our guests, our show, and our stories, visit WYCC.org and look for the link to In the Loop. Until next week, I'm Chris Bury. Good night.